Today is Tuesday, October the 30th, 2012. I'm Matthew T.G. I'm Heath Mullican. And I'm Tony Casey. Welcome to The Technology Show, a weekly podcast featuring technology, theology, and everything in between. This is episode 178. That threw me off. You know, I, I have a pregame ritual where I dance while the music's playing. I couldn't hear the music. I couldn't dance. I... Maybe that was intentional. Yeah, You, you know what? I, after... Today's show, Teej, we're going to retire Heath's mic over there. No. Yeah, that, that thing, no. that behemoth. I mean, look at it. It's just laying down. I'm going to paint it gold. can't get the stand to hold it anymore, <laughs> man. When a mic weighs more than you do, Heath, it's time to retire the Trust mic. me, the mic does not weigh more. All right. Uh, listen, as we begin, uh, we didn't have a giveaway uh, that we're you know, touting um, from last week, but we do have a giveaway um, that you can enter to win, and that is... Um, Dr. James Emery White's book, uh, What They Didn't Teach You in Seminary. And so uh, Master T.G. will be getting us set up on that. And as usual, you can go to our website and just uh, click the giveaways tab there. And next week, we'll give that away on the air. And let me just use that as an introduction to welcome Dr. James Emery White. He's the founding and senior pastor of Mecklenburg Community Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, president of Serious Times, a ministry which explores the intersection of faith and culture and ranked adjunct professor of theology and culture on the Charlotte campus of Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. Dr. White holds a BS, MDiv, and PhD degrees, along with additional work at Vanderbilt University and Oxford University. He's the author of over a dozen books. Dr. White, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, so we were telling, just talking in the pre-show, uh, we came across this book as a result. All of us serve on the same district in the Wesleyan Church, and our district superintendent highly recommended this book. Uh, when I first heard the title, there's kind of this knee-jerk reaction to it, and that is, you know, that maybe uh, this is a book that's anti-education, but uh, I know that, that it's far from it. So why don't you just elaborate, and we'll just start right there. Yeah, sure. That would be a shame if anyone did think that it was taking a shot at advanced um, education. As I, as you mentioned in the lead-in, uh, a lot of my life has been in academia, uh, not only as a student all the way through, but also as a professor and even as the president of a seminary. So I'm not anti-seminary, and I'm certainly not anti-theological uh, education. I'm very much in favor of it. Uh, but like a lot of people, uh, when I finished seminary and I actually began ministry and began being a pastor, it became glaringly obvious all that I had not been taught, all that I did not know, things that can only be learned from the trenches. Yeah. Or if you're fortunate, if you're well mentored by someone who has had many, many years in the ministry. Well, I didn't have that. I grew up basically unchurched. I didn't become a Christ follower until I was 20. Wow. I didn't have a background in the church. I didn't really have any uh, mentors in terms of the practice of ministry, uh, which I think makes me somewhat typical, quite frankly, in terms of not necessarily having a lot of stuff in place. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so this book is attempting to be that from the trenches mentoring about what they don't teach you in seminary and quite frankly can't teach you in seminary. And that's in fairness to the seminary. They're trying to give you history and theology and biblical studies and so forth. Um, most of the people who teach in seminaries have never pastored a church, or maybe they've just had a short stint as a interim or something of that nature. They're academics, and they do what they do very, very well. And we need that academic training. Sure. But uh, this book tries to fill in what you'll do now every day for the rest of your life. Dr. White, I wonder sometimes, maybe for those of us who go into seminary, if we have um, the wrong expectations as far as the practical aspects are concerned. I'm just thinking, um, I was a student at Asbury Theological, and I remember a real moment of clarity in my education. I was sitting in a theology class, and there was a student who was complaining that he did he couldn't bring practical aspects out of the class into the student pastor he had at the time. There was a second career student there. Uh, his profession was pharmacy, and he spoke up, and he said, listen, in pharmacy school, we were taught that what they were giving us was 20% of what we were going to need. And he said, what that was was theory, and it was a base, and was something to build on. He said, but they made it clear that 80% uh, of, of what we needed eventually we were going to get within the practice. And so I wonder if there aren't times, and I'm curious what you think, if, if maybe our expectations are, are too high in terms of what we expect out of that experience. 
I think there's two things that uh, we can we often expect of seminary that it doesn't deliver. I think we could have a, a pretty interesting conversation about whether or not they're fair or not. Uh, many would say that they are fair expectations. One of them is uh, we're going to assume that the academic is there. Okay, most seminaries deliver on that well. Yeah. But the sec the first expectation that often is unfulfilled is uh, the spiritual life of the person attending. Mm. Some people have found that seminary are three of the driest, toughest years spiritually mm. of their life. Yeah. Uh, they don't walk away closer to Christ. They walk away often further away. Well, uh, that's not really good. And what's at what's uh, exacerbating that is a lot of people go to seminary thinking it's going to be a three-year mountaintop experience. Yep. So that's a big crash and burn. Yep. A second uh, expectation that uh, may or may not be fair is that you really will learn how to pastor and lead a church. That you really will know how to grow one of these things. Mm. And, uh, and lead it effectively. And see, here's where a breakdown is. The churches that hire seminary grads are assuming that's what seminary did. Yeah, yeah. Right. Just got equipped to feed and to lead. Mm. Uh, well, they probably got equipped to feed, but I don't think they got equipped many times. I don't want to paint with too broad of a stroke, sure. but to lead. Wow. Yep. And, um, and, and, and here's where I think maybe it is a fair expectation. Why is it that a typical seminary graduate can go to a three-day Catalyst event or a three-day Willow Creek Leadership Summit and walk away after that three days and say, I learned more about doing church effectively in these three days than I did in my three years? Seminaries will say, we don't have time to add anything else to the curriculum. We, we, we're doing all that we can in those three years. Well, my pushback, even as a professor and as a former seminary president, you can't find even that three days yeah. worth of material. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So surely, surely we can do keep the academic and also do better with the practical. Well, yeah. there are some people. I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with the debate that says that seminary tries to do too much, and that sometimes there is an identity crisis as to what seminary is supposed to accomplish. Uh, is is it an academic track or is it a professional track? <laughs> And yeah. and what yeah. they and some say they don't do either one well. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, I mean, I, I I will absolutely absolutely go to my go to the mattresses on the fact that the the seminary exists to serve the church. It does not exist to serve the academy. Great. If you want to go on to the academy, don't get an MDiv. Go and get a THM or get a other master's degree and go straight for the PhD track, and that's fine. Sure. Um, I went on for my PhD, and I'm all in favor of it. But the MDiv is a degree that is designed for the church and for ministry. Uh, it is not uh, designed to have you at three years later loving the church less and bowing down in front of the academy. Mm. Very good. Mm. Before we get into the specifics of the book, tell us a little bit about the church you planted in 1992 and the journey uh, that unfolded from that. Yeah, I, I have the... Um, the real privilege of, of being the, the founding and senior pastor of, of Mecklenburg Community Church in Charlotte, the north side of Charlotte, and um, which didn't exist when I came here 20 years ago, the north side of Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, was a, I really was your typical church planner. I, my wife and I arrived in a U-Haul truck. We had no core group. Uh, we had no money, no people, no building. There was, there was no hiving off or from another church or a split. It was just us. And... Um, we uh, we started from scratch. Uh, started in a in fact a torrential rainstorm. Uh, tropical storm Earl struck the Carolinas on our first day. Wow. Uh, God was gracious. We had 112 people at our first service. Through the strength of my communication skills, I had that sucker at 56. <laughs> by the third <laughs> uh, and we we began to grow from there. And uh, so it was a what I would call a healthy church plant in the sense that. If, if you're looking for church plant models, and I'm not saying that we should be one, but if you're looking at them, you know, sometimes it, we're attracted to the ones that go from zero to, you know, a thousand yeah. in six months. Yeah, right. um, those are really not the best models necessarily because those are, you know, unique. Um, we we kind of had more traditional role. I mean, we're a very large church now, but I mean, it's a, been a 20 year run. Mm. Um, it's so hard. This book is just chock full of practical things. I mean, the subtitle of the book is 25 Lessons for S Successful Ministry in Your Church. Um, so, you know, we're kind of left to cherry pick here. It's hard to get them all. So one that really rose to the surface for me was uh, 
the lessons that this book deals with uh, in terms of ministry staff and volunteers of the church. Take a moment and talk about the five C's and, and this concept of a farm club, or excuse me, a farm league approach to staffing the church. Yeah. Well, whether you're, you're, you're looking at hiring or whether you're looking at building a volunteer team, uh, there are five things that I, I talk about that we have learned, I have learned certainly over the years, are critical. And whenever I have violated one of these, it has cost me enormously. Yeah. Um, in fact, most of the lessons from this book have come from mistakes uh, sure. and um, the hard lessons. Um, here are the five C's. Uh, obviously, you're looking for character because you can't, you can't teach character. It's either there or it's not. A second one that I like is I want someone who's catalytic. And what I mean by catalytic is they've got a spring in their step. I mean, they're, they're, they're going to create things. They're going to make things happen. I've always told folks I'd much rather rein somebody in than try to jumpstart them forward. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you're looking for competence in any particular role that you're trying to fulfill. Uh, basic competence. But that's also, I think, something that's fairly easy with a sharp person to to have them uh, help them with. Um, I'm, the next one is uh, one that uh, usually gets creates some conversation whenever it's brought up, um, and that's chemistry. I unashamedly think mm -hmm. that you should look to build teams of good chemistry, uh, mm -hmm. people you like. Um, we kind of have a joke around mech. Uh, we call it the beer test. Uh, mm -hmm. is, if, is this someone who, after a long day of working together, uh, in the midst of the hits and the hurts and the challenges and so forth of, of ministry, at the end of the day, would you want to go out and have a beer with this person? Now, it, this has nothing to do with whether or not you feel free to imbibe. I'm not trying to get it. <laughs> it's a quick, short way of cutting to the chase of whether this person uh, breathes life into you or sucks the life out yeah, of you. Right, yeah. You want to build a team around good chemistry. Um, and uh, then the final one is that are they called? And I know everybody might say, well, gosh, I'm assuming that they're going to be called. I mean, you, why would you be bringing somebody on staff, or even someone as a volunteer. No, 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 no. I find that there's a lot of people who will uh, apply for jobs or want to serve or something, and they've got an ulterior agenda, or it's um, they've got, um, they're doing it out of expedience. They're really not called. Um, in fact, I think in the book I talk about, you know, uh, a gut check. If you were not receiving a paycheck, would you be attending this church? If the answer is no, I wouldn't. It's just a staff role. It's a job. Well, then you're not called. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, you said a little bit earlier here that a lot of these things came as about uh, came about as mistakes. You learned as you went. And I'm just thinking, you know, of all the, the books that John Maxwell has written on leadership, I have said that my favorite is his book, Failing Forward. And the point he makes in that book, he gives a lot of anecdotal stories, but the main point he's trying to drive home is if we are afraid to fail, we'll never succeed because it's in that process that we learn. And um, I just wonder is, you know, I'm sure that it's not only true for this chapter, but for you, this is probably much of the book has just come out of that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, um, the, the it's the as I mentioned the hits and the hurts of ministry, uh, that's like that that's what has formed you. That is what has molded you. That is what has given you your most priceless lessons. And um, and so, yeah, I mean it's easy to just talk about here's what we did and wow that just worked. Okay, well let me do it as a principle. Um, and there's a place for that. But when you have gone at something twelve different ways, yeah. and eleven of those twelve just taught you priceless lessons of failure, but then you finally arrived at the 12th way, and you accumulate those over, in my case, over 30 years of vocational ministry, yeah. uh, these become deep-seated truths that you have seen proved over time and time again, not simply through trial and error and mistake, but also seeing the lessons applied over and over again to different situations, and it continues to work, and that's when you start to say, I think there's something really important here that we can talk about. Uh, as leaders. And so the 25 uh, chapters, the 25 lessons, all are of that kind. Yeah. And that's why I felt, I mean, I certainly couldn't have written this book much earlier than this. I mean, it takes uh, some time in the saddle before you can start reflecting and really saying this is one of those principles. Sure. 
one, one of the more interesting chapter titles in your book is it's the weekend, stupid. Uh, can you can you tell you know what was the reason for that title and what points are you trying to make in that chapter? Well, we're in a presidential election. Let's go back to Clinton <laughs> yeah. in uh, ninety two, yeah. and uh, James Carville was his political strategist, and he created a sign that he put up in every reelection office of Clinton, and it simply said, "It's the economy, stupid." Yeah. yeah. And the idea was this is a one point election. This is a one theme election. Yeah. Um, we got to hammer this one home and not ever get off track. And he was right. Uh, Clinton scored an upset. And because Bush had some of the highest favorability ratings ever prior to that due to Desert Storm and things of that nature, and yep. Clinton still won. Because it did end up being the economy. Um, I did something similar for our staff where I created a sign several years ago that just said, It's the weekend, stupid. And we had that, and that's still hanging up in some of the offices at the church. And uh, the idea was, uh, when it comes to outreach and growth, um, that's the front door of the church. Mm. I think it was true then. I think it's still true now. If you have an invest and invite methodology, which most churches have and most churches are finding is one of the better strategies of our day, you go out, you build relationships with unchurched people, and then you bring them into uh, a setting um, that is um, conducive to them exploring the Christian faith and, and, and coming to faith in Christ and connecting with the community and then from there growing in, in their faith. If you have that kind of invest and invite strategy uh, and you've got one big front door, which is the weekend, well, let's just kind of boil this sucker down. It's the weekend. Yeah. That's, mm. I mean, I, this sounds crass and people can jump all over my terminology, but give me an umbrella of grace here. That's showtime. That's the main event. That's when you have all hands on deck. Yep. That's when you can uh, win them or lose them. And so right. we have put a lot of effort into that. And uh, that particular chapter goes over how to make the weekend uh, achieve its full redemptive potential. Yeah. Um, I told you, in the, you know, when we were introducing each other in the pre-show, that part of my responsibility is our district responsibilities and our denomination. Our structure is such that there are churches that we oversee. And I can't tell you, I just can't tell you how many times I've been in a situation where we're meeting with pastor and the church and it's conflict. And at some point it becomes very clear what hill the pastor is dying on. And I just want to, I just want to, I want to take a time out really quick and walk outside and say, now, are you sure that this is the hill you want to die on? So for me, chapter 10 of your book or lesson number 10 is a huge one. Talk to us a little bit about this thing of, of knowing what hills to die on. Yeah, um, um, I know exactly how you felt with those situations. Um, the hills you'll die on, these are the most important, critical issues that you're going to elevate as essentially core values. Mm -hmm. And in that chapter, I talk about how we can have a whole bunch of peripheral things that we can get very exercised about and almost make hills we'll die on that don't deserve it. Yeah. But I lay out 10 hills in that chapter that I believe to the core of my being, yeah, you better die on these hills. Sure. These are the ones that are worth it. These are the ones that matter. Um, this, th this is what you, uh, think of it this way, if you're going to lose somebody over something, you know, these are the 10 you would willingly lose a family over or a group of families or however many it need be. Uh, if standing for this value means you take a church of 8,000 to 8, it would be worth it. Um, That's good. And so uh, these are values like lost people matter to God. Uh, the Bible is true. <laughs> um, uh, we want to be culturally relevant while remaining doctrinally pure. Um, you know, and on and on it goes. So, so I, I suggest 10 in there. Those are just three of them that uh, are the important values. Can I ask this, just a follow-up question? How is it that we get so sidetracked, and, and really, and you know this, and I know that you've seen it, where we've got ministers that literally will die on a molehill. I mean, how does, it, how does that happen? How does it escalate to something like that? A lot of it has to do, or can be, with uh, ego and pride. We we don't we don't want to. Um, you know, we uh, we have weird things that we call our turf, or we get. We yeah. don't want to um, give in on a particular issue, and all of a sudden we find ourselves not wanting to give in on anything. Uh, sometimes it's a control issue. Uh, we just want to be controlling, which is uh, 
a real dangerous thing because uh, the more controlling you are, the more you will limit your church's growth. Um, but anyway, I think I think a lot of times it, it has to do more with with us as leaders that we can get um, petty, and also again, uh, without trying to throw all those folks under the bus, a lot of times it goes back to mentoring. I mean, uh, whoever pulled yeah. you aside yeah. to yeah. tell you that that's a molehill, you may actually think you're dying on a hill that you should die on. The color of that carpet really does matter. Yeah. And you haven't anybody tell you, you know, friend. Um, yeah, no, good point. No, no, it doesn't. Yeah, very good. Mm. Uh, now, at a quick glance, I'm sure people would be surprised that you have a chapter entitled Don't Preach. <laughs> However, you give great practical advice in that portion of your book. What, what do you mean when you say don't preach? Yeah, uh, I quickly say don't preach, but do communicate. Yeah. And and I, and I think there's a there's a big difference. when uh, And again, this is something they, that... They typically haven't taught in seminaries. Um, and again, this is going to sound like I'm really being pejorative toward them, but let me just talk in shorthand. And um, What they teach often is how to preach but not to communicate. They teach homiletics, but they don't teach how to connect with an unchurched person. They don't teach how to really um, build a bridge through culture to speak to a, a soccer mom or a guy who's just put in 50 hours a week and he's 35 years old and he just flew in on Friday and he kissed his wife and he's got two kids and he's trying to make ends meet and he, and he watched porn in the hotel room and he's kind of dealing with some guilt related to that and you know he's, he's in his six year of marriage and he's not sure if it's going to work and all that kind of stuff and and he comes in on a weekend because a friend of his invited him and he's going to give this thing maybe one shot. He doesn't even want to be there. and He's wondering if he's going to get out in time for the football game and, and then you stand up and what are you going to do? Yeah. Well, hopefully you're going to communicate with that guy in a way that he gets it and he relates to you and he's attracted to you as another man and as a fellow human being, as somebody who says, man, I can relate to this guy. I think this guy actually understands my world. Yeah. And and so there's a difference between communication and preaching. Preaching, you know, it's almost like, how can I take the word God and say it with three syllables? I mean, that's just, that's not what we're after. <laughs> so many people will talk in, in a different voice. They'll, they'll, when they, when they <laughs> preach, it, it, it's like they're not even talking the way they would talk to you at a Starbucks. <laughs> so communication is critical. And the most effective uh, people who are in ministry are indeed communicators. And I also firmly believe that you know, you're supposed to have the spiritual gift of communication, that that's something that the Holy Spirit gives. And there's a lot of people that either don't have it, but maybe to be um, generous, <laughs> they've got the gift, but they've never developed it because nobody's ever taught them how to develop the gift of communication because only someone who has it and knows how to communicate can do that. Yeah. And sadly, um, um, and again, this sounds a little rougher than I want to, but, there's, but a lot of people who teach preaching in seminary aren't good communicators and they don't necessarily have the spiritual gift of communication. They teach a homiletics and they mm -hmm. teach a lot of... Um, well, let me stop before I sin. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one of the just, things, I mean, there's another yeah. dynamic to your book here. You, you, you talk about the importance of um, community involvement, relationships. And so part of me wonders, as I hear you talk about this thing of communicating when we preach, um, I mean, that's, again, we're just cherry picking your book here. I mean, you can't do that if, if you're really not rubbing shoulders with the guy who's working 50 hours a week. I mean, to be honest, s some people can identify um, and they're not going to be able to communicate because they honestly don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I often, at some gatherings, I mean, I used, I used to do this a lot more. I would raise this question. I would just say, okay, how many of you, like I'm at a pastor's conference or something, how many of you have had a coffee at a Starbucks with an unchurched, card-carrying, hell-bound guy in the last six weeks? Yeah, yeah. Mm. And, 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 I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it got so awkward that I stopped doing it because there would be so few hands, wow. if any. Wow. Um, and so the, we, we tend to, to run in our Christian cliques and our evangelical subculture and our friends or other pastors, and, and we're just not, we're not in the world or of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, the, and, and a lot of times our illustrations are out of date, and somebody talks about Breaking Bad, and they have no idea even what Breaking Bad is. <laughs> I mean, there's such a cultural disconnect. It's almost like some of these guys are just now finding out there was a band named U2 and a lead singer named Bono, and they're feeling <laughs> hip. And, 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 you know, but they, they, um, 
you know, they, uh, they're not really, um, you know, they wouldn't know Mumford and Sons if the CD fell on their head. So th this, is, this is the challenge that I think we're facing is that we're not students of culture and that help yeah. that hurts us with being communicators. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we pulled out parts of this book that we really like or speak to us. Um, so let me just kind of throw it back at you and maybe there's parts of this book you'd like to highlight or something you'd just like to say about the book generally. Yeah. Uh, it goes all over the place. Uh, and it's ex meant to be just bleeding practical. Uh, and I've been so pleased that it really is, it, you know, people are saying, you know, it, it really is kind of the, the seminary education I never got in seminary. So I'm, I'm so thrilled with that. And yeah. I wished I had paid less of a cost for some of these lessons, but I'm <laughs> delighted that they might serve. Um, a couple of things that I really like about the book, personally, some of my favorite chapters are when I talk about the spiritual life of a leader and just the, mm -hmm. kind of from the trenches, what does it mean to walk with Christ as a pastor, which is really weird. Uh, can get really weird. And then also, um, one I've got a lot of feedback on is the chapter on emotional survival. Mm. Ah, yeah, wow. yeah, I'm not that surprised was, by that. That was, that was pivotal for a lot of people, and, and, I, and, and, uh, and I know it was for me, Yeah, uh, the, what was behind that. Well, people identify with that. I mean, it's, it's visceral as you read it. You say, hey, that's my experience in ministry. Um, so yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not Anybody surprised. Anybody who's truly been there, yeah, I can identify. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, real quick here. I mean, you know, we we try to we try to be good hosts, and we like to send our questions to the person we're interviewing. So I'm gonna go off script here, and, and just and which is always dangerous. I know, uh, and I don't mean to paint you. Been you in following a, the script all this time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not trying to paint you in a corner, but I mean, part of my passion is this in education. Let's talk about theological education or even education like in the religion department of a Christian college. Mm -hmm. I understand the academic requirements. So, so, so a lot of people don't know, uh, you know, with, within the church general, they don't understand that there are accrediting agencies and you have to meet these standards. And so part of that has to do with degrees. People have to have certain degrees. I get that. But what can we do in terms of getting those who are out here in the field who are doing it, and I'm not talking about a flash in the pan, I'm talking about people who for 20, 30, 40 years, they've been the demonstration of how ministry needs to happen. How can we get that into the classroom? Or or is, is that the wrong model? I mean, is, is there another model out there? Yeah, I th I'll tell you what I think the future of theological education is in relation to the church. Um, it, the, the old and I'll, this is overly simplified, but I believe this. I think the old model was um, the church goes to the seminary. You send these people to the seminary. I think the new model is the seminary is going to come to the church. Yeah. Mm, wow! And I think that what is going to happen is is that seminaries are going to create. It'll happen first with the large churches. We're we're involved in developing this ourselves as as we speak wow. with a one of the top five seminaries in the world. Um, but it's going to start off with the large churches simply because they have the resources, but it'll, it'll trickle down. Yep. But uh, seminaries will come alongside uh, churches, and uh, they will take advantage of the experience, the learning, the knowledge of the leadership of that church, the pastoral leadership and others, and uh, provide opportunities for that pastor to um, pour into younger leaders. And the seminary and accrediting agencies, if they're smart, will find ways to give credit for that, yes. even if it's just field hours, yes. mentor right. ministry, something. Yeah. And then they'll come alongside and through technology and other forms, you know, I think professors will become more roving um, mm. because the bricks and mortar day are over. Right. Yeah, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with 12 Stone in Atlanta and Kevin Myers there, the pastor. I mean, this is kind of the track that they're taking. They're yeah. actually working with Indiana Wesleyan University and things that they're doing with theological education. And um, we got to hear him speak this past summer. And he, he, he talks about the need for theology, doctrine, not doing away with that. But the model right. that he is uh, touting is that once you're done with that experience for two years— I mean, you, you are on staff at a church for two years. It is your full-time job. Um, and, and this is where you get, now you build on this, this academic base yeah. that you had. So well, we, we, We're developing a two-year program, leadership development program, mm. that will result in a master's degree wow. conferred on you uh, by a seminary in Christian leadership. Wow. And, um, and so uh, these people are rooted in the church, on staff of the church, leadership of the church. They go through this rigorous program for two years, 
we 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 get the dream leadership development program that uh, includes the best of what seminary has to offer. They get a master's degree. I mean, it's it's all done at the church. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the future. Yeah, you know, I had a professor at Asbury, Dr. Goodwin, and this was a I mean, this was a passion with him. I mean, he was at that time. That was I graduated in '93. I mean, he was very outspoken that we need a different model. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, listen. Um, before we let you go, uh, where can our listeners find you on the internet? And also, just take time out here to talk about any projects you're presently working on. Um, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, on the internet, uh, most of my home is at churchandculture.org, churchandculture.org. Right. That's where I blog. I mean, the, the blog is uh, carried in other places, but that's that's its host, its home. That's where uh, the resources that I develop and other things. We have a, a cool thing where every day we also pick the, the latest top four headlines from the news related to church and culture. That's seven days a week. So it's a, it's a fun site. You can subscribe to all this stuff for free. Um, so I would encourage people to look at that. Um, yeah, um, I, I had two books come out in the last, uh, three books come out in the last 18 months because I was sitting on uh, several projects during actually my presidency of Gordon Conwell. And so a lot of them have come out at once, the one we're talking about. And then about seven or eight months ago, a book called um, A Traveler's Guide to the Kingdom, which is a look at 10 key sites around the world. I'm looking at some of the faces behind you. Actually, there's a chapter on Corey Ten Boom, a chapter on Lewis, oh. uh, and so um, um, and Luther as well. Uh, but going to the actual sites like Wittenberg, Eagle and Child Pub, wow. uh, Harlem, Great. and uh, pulling out the lessons for the Christian life from these people and their stories. And then the book that just came out is called The Church in an Age of Crisis, The 25 New Realities Facing Christianity, which is a, um, kind of a, a cultural tour of all that's uh, happening and shaping our world right now that is uh, creating some interesting conversation. I've been really pleased with how that's been received. Well, listen, we appreciate you taking time out of a very busy schedule to be with us. We're honored to have you, and uh, we'll put links to all the books you've just discussed here, and plus we'll put a link to your website. Yeah, let me go back to that and just restate that. You need to read Church and Culture. It's a great website, and go back from earlier this summer and find the article about the snow cone guy. Because that was fantastic, <laughs> and it made me very happy. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we actually discussed that uh, on one of our episodes, uh, the snow cone uh, the guy. The snow cone guy, uh, who was great. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Dr. White, thanks again for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Hey, thanks right. a lot. Bye-bye. Yeah, good stuff. Can't can't recommend this book enough. Um, again, our district superintendent put us on to it. Uh, we'll be giving a copy of, away next week for this book. And so, as always, go to our website and just hit the giveaways tab there. Enter as many times as you want. I'm going to tell you, if, if you struggle to know how to do this, contact Seth, Seth Cotton. Because, like, he is, the, he is the expert at this. Um, but I he's would, smart. He, he's so smart to... I mean, he's a poor seminary student, <laughs> and, you know, if only we were giving away textbooks. a seminary book. Yeah, yeah textbooks. exactly. He would be in business. Yeah. But textbooks cost I'm, $900. See, what I'm wondering is, does Seth hit all the freebie sites like he hits ours? Because <laughs> maybe, maybe he's taking them and then selling them on eBay. <laughs> I don't it's think. income. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Here we go. Uh, let's move on to... What? I ah, see. I was trying to get you to stall for a little bit longer. How about I was Download of the Week? Okay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming, folks. There it is. Okay. Yeah. Yay. Yay. So we thought for Download of the Week, a great thing to do is just to bring attention to what's already on everyone's heart and mind in the Northeast, and this is this hurricane. We've given you a couple of links. One link is, um, it's not really a download, it's just a link. You can go to it. It's for the Red Cross and different ways that you can be part of the relief effort by giving financially, and then there are other ways that you can do that. Also, um, Matthew, you found uh, just an app, I think, for the Red Cross. Uh, uh, a whole, we'll, we'll put a link to the whole page. The Red okay. Cross has about six different applications. One's, you know, hurricane tracking that you could have actually used, you know, for, for Sandy. One's a shelter location finder, um, if you, you know where to, ever to need it. There's one on there that's first aid that just uh, walks yep. you through practical first aid okay. uh, tips that, you know, if you, in that moment, sometimes there's that panic moment, well, what do we do? 
uh, yeah. we'll walk you through. Um, if you if you want to give to relief, uh, this website will show you just different ways you can do it. One is just by texting. Yeah. Um, Matthew pointed out to us before the show that they've worked out a lot of deals with AT and T, yeah. Verizon, things of that nature, where they're not you're not charged for the call and that money goes directly to yeah, it's a, Red it's Cross. It's a text message, and and AT and T doesn't I don't believe pull any money from it. I think you text uh, Red Cross. To, it's a nine. Don't I can't remember. I'll yeah. look it up. Uh, but then on your bill, a ten dollars donation to Red Cross will appear and that's just an easy way to, to give and I mean definitely you know our thoughts and prayers go out to everybody affected by the storm uh, I think there's almost 7 million people without power and it's kind of ironic that one of the things they're telling all these people to do is to uh, make sure they keep checking ready, ready.gov to, to make sure they know what to do in the storm and they don't have power so I'm not really sure how they're maybe they have a generator you don't know <laughs> If they were prepared. We've got to. We're not prepared. We got to be prepared. All righty, let's keep moving here. Time for they said it. Read my lips. I'm going to say this again. I've never taken steroids or HGH. I took the initiative in creating the internet. The Macintosh of all the machines I've ever seen is the only one that meets that standard. Well, I'm not a crook. If you if you know what you're doing here, slide slide out. You may be tempted by a model from a lesser known brand, especially if it's priced well below uh, comparable major brand sets. But getting the cheapest set for the money doesn't always turn out to be the best deal. James K. Wilcox warning consumers that buying a cheap off-brand TV on this year's Black Friday may cost you more later. Source: Consumer Reports. You want to serve the Lord. You're always going to have dirty hands. You don't get to a place, you don't get to a size where your hands are clean. Your heart is free from heartbreak, loss, the celebration, the need for prayer, the desperation that comes from leading and walking with God's people. Matt Chandler addressing pastors during the Creature of the World simulcast October the 23rd, warning them that harboring a sense of entitlement can kill the church. Source, the Christian Post. Regardless of what happens, he's been a great representative of the game of football and a great representative for his university. Clemson University football coach Dabo Sweeney commenting on South Carolina game pop, Gamecock running back Marcus Lattimore after his devastating knee injury during an October 27th football game. Source, Yahoo Sports. For an audacious version 1.0 product, it's impressive. Now it's up to Microsoft to prove that it's serious enough about the PC business to forge ahead with Surface until it's impressive, period. Harry McCracken summing up his review of the Microsoft Service tablet. Source, Time Magazine. All right, so let's top, start at the top here. Yep. Um, you know, this is just kind of a, we're getting close to Black Friday. This is kind of a nice little warning by, a warning by Consumer Reports. going to be all kinds of deals on yeah. televisions, on yeah. screens, and uh, you're going to go to Walmart or whatever it is, and you're going to see uh, <laughs> a television, and it's going to have a brand name that you may not have ever heard of right. before. The TG, uh, the or TG television. See, right, <laughs> or only seen on Black Fridays. Well, yeah. uh, just uh, basically, um, yeah, you can wind up with the saying yeah. you get what you pay for in, yep. a, in a way you got to be careful there will be some good deals some yep. some actual deals on some actual good brands but uh I, for me like if somebody asked me and they have before should i get this television what should i do it's like if you have not seen yeah. that brand anywhere else i wouldn't buy it the other thing you could try to do is look up that brand name and yeah. call their customer service ahead of time yeah. and see, you know, can you actually get somebody on the phone or talk with somebody beforehand? Because uh, I've actually, I actually came into that problem. I had bought a, a, a cheap um, on sale television of a brand name that I'd never heard of before and haven't ever seen since. Mm. And uh, uh, it started to experience problems. <laughs> yeah. uh, the warranty was pitiful on it. I couldn't get it repaired. I couldn't get in contact yeah. with customer service. Yeah. I ended up selling the television. Uh, somebody used it for about a year and a half, and it died. Uh, so. wow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, our TV, somebody gave us a TV. Uh, it's one of those lesser-named brand, and within, I think they had used it for maybe four or five months, 
and within four or five months of us getting it just completely, completely dead. So, I mean, you got to do, you know, definitely do due diligence, do your research. We're, and we're doing their homework for them. If you go to this article, yes, this Consumer is, Reports, very good article. The, the article that I sent. Yes, yeah. that's right. So there you go. Not I'm always to... thinking about you people. Yeah. But it's Consumer Reports article. They'll list some of the good brands: Panasonic, uh, uh, LG, Sony. I mean, those are Samsung, uh, Samsung Vizio. right? Vizio's Vizio's like a, a great. It's an American company. Uh, yeah. uh, Vizio's. And here, here's another thing. Sorry to interrupt you, man. You, you but make sure, like, <laughs> make sure you if like a brand. If you don't know anybody who owns that brand, that's not a brand to get. Exactly. Like you said, Vizio. Everybody owns exactly. Vizio. Exactly. And it also doesn't count like, okay. I would, never mind. <laughs> but Vizio, you had a you had an issue with the remote control from your Vizio mm -hmm. television. They handled it. Yeah, and they didn't charge me anything. Yeah. They sent me a brand new one. Yeah, and um, you were able to get in contact with them. It wasn't a, it wasn't a problem. Yeah. And now you have five five remotes for that. I for just that, have one, okay. For that TV. Yeah. All right, uh, Matt Chandler's article that shows up in the Christian Post, uh, interesting to me. I mean, he, he, he goes over, uh, you know, what he means by entitlement when a church gets uh, a sense of entitlement, but he starts with the pastor, so he's addressing pastors. I thought this was interesting. He said when he was a young pastor, a mentor of his put dirt in his hands, put a little water in there, made him rub his hands together, and, you know, he does this, and then his mentor says, listen, that's ministry. And yeah. don't you ever think that your hands are going to be clean in ministry. It, it's messy when you jump into people's lives. And if you ever begin in ministry to feel sorry for yourself and feel entitled about certain things, what you're going to do is you're going to create a staff that feels the same way. And before long, that culture is going to pass right down to your congregation. You have a whole church. And it'll kill the mission of the church. Right. And this this uh, simulcast, he just came out with a book, Creature of the Word, and this kind of was going on with that. And uh, the whole book, uh, that book, Creature of the Word, is, a, is about um, you know building a Jesus-centered church. And I think what he's saying is, there's a very much a danger of building a pastor personality centered church. And I think he's, I mean, in layman's terms, Matt Chandler's trying to keep it real. He's just trying to keep it real. Yeah, avoid the prima donna, um, you know, this, this idea that I'm somebody. Um, as long as, long as, you know, as, long as uh, my parking spot is there every Sunday. Sure, right. Uh, as long as they've got my Hot coffee. coffee right there ready for my you. My coffee ready. And um, someone tying your shoes for you. An endless supply of plaid shirts. I will be completely happy. Plaid as a pastor. <laughs> That's pathetic. <laughs> All right. Oh, uh, our next story uh, whether you're a South Carolina Gamecock fan or not, this past Saturday <laughs> was tragic. They have a, a great running back. Uh, he had a knee injury last year, serious one, came back from that. And then on Saturday had a, another just devastating knee injury. And this may, I mean, it may be the end of his career. Um, and so devastating is is a very nice word to say for that injury. Oh, if you've seen the clip, yeah. it makes me ill. Yeah. Um, and I think there there are two lines that Heath and I want to grab here. Number yes. one is to we, we cannot underscore what a quality young man this is. Yes. Um, and so the South Carolina coach put it well. He's a great representative for the sport for his university. He's also a great representative for humanity itself. Yeah, I heard a great story. Uh, being in the Clemson area, people know people and know people and know people. But I heard a story: Marcus Latimer's ninth grade year in high school. He his mother goes up to the school and and tells him, "If you have any trouble with him, you call me." Sure enough, his ninth grade year, he's goofing off a little bit. They call his mom. His mom comes up there, takes him into the office. He comes out crying. I mean, this is a legendary story comes out crying, never got in trouble again. <laughs> I mean, this is a guy, who, you know, raised by a single mother and... and, and, and Just quality. Quality young and quality, you know, a mother who, who would do something like that to keep her, her son in line. Just, and I mean, and that's why it's... You it's, don't wish anyone to get hurt. Yeah. But there's so, some... Yeah. Well, so this, this piggybacks on a, another issue now that we've yeah. talked about. So now we're transitioning. This kid... The university's made millions of dollars off of him. If he if he had not gotten injured, and his career yeah. may be over, yeah. if he would not gotten injured, we know that he would have been a first-round draft pick, yeah. would have signed a multi-million dollar contract. Yeah. Um, there, 
what responsibility does the university have towards him? It gets, this gets back to this whole thing of paying players. I mean, every, they, they sell Lattimore jerseys. Who knows what the university makes off of that? But he couldn't yeah. even sell his own uh, right. jersey without being in violation with the NCAA. Well, here's, here's the thing. You have the NCAA, which um, markets and licenses – the NCAA football game for all the major video game platforms. If you went on that game and you, you chose the University of South Carolina as your team and you went onto their roster, there would be a number 21. Wow. Wow. He would have Marcus Latimer's number. He would have his haircut. He would have his weight. He would have his height. He'd have his skill rankings. I mean, they have put Marcus Latimer on the game, but his name on the game is uh, halfback number 21. So... Absolutely, in more ways than people can even realize. And we're not just talking about the school. We're talking about ESP. Whoever airs their games makes money off of them. The people that advertise on that game make money. So it is a very, I mean, it's, I was going to say it's borderline exploitation, but we may be over, way said, over the line. I said to you today when, when you came, and I know that a lot of people take me to task for this, but I said, if the university doesn't find a way to take care of this kid, right. that's immoral. Right. Yeah. I know I've heard, um, I, I, can't, I cannot remember the, the athlete's name. He came back for his junior year and, and got, it might have been a basketball player, but got a, uh, Lloyd, like a Lloyd's of London type, insurance policy out on out on himself in case he got hurt. Right. Uh, I know that not obviously not through Lloyd's of London, but there are insurance policies like that for certain NCAA athletes. I haven't heard the latest as to whether or not he would be not, that caliber of player. But the question is, who makes those payments? How does he right. make the premiums? Those premiums can't be cheap. Right. 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 And and here, yeah, um, it it is a. And, and and here's my hope. My number one, my hope is he makes a full recovery. He comes back. That he does play football again. That's my, that's my first thing. My second thing is that we're not the only ones talking about this. That's such a horrific injury. We're not talking about the. We're talking about you know Heisman candidate. We are talking about one of the the top ten, top fifteen players in college football. So. I'm hoping that it opens up this can of worms for this discussion, maybe, and maybe they're not they're, that they're paid, but at least about these insurance, uh, you know, these insurance policies, something to take care. I mean, think about all the think about the kid who's not Marcus Latimer caliber, but who during a four year college career suffers six concussions and has lifelong yeah. issues because of that. Because of yeah. it, I said just get rid of. College sports all Oh, TG, TG. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what were we just talking about? We're this Matthew academic. TG at gmail.com. <laughs> academic, <laughs> academic institution. And no, that's why I wear this Carolina hat for the quality of education. <laughs> oh for the quality not, of education that you can get at UNC. It Chapel certainly Hill. has nothing to do with the football team. No. Oh, they're <laughs> hell. Or, no. No, it doesn't. Nothing to do with the football team, and I'll promise you that. It has everything to do with <laughs> Women's soccer. I love it. All right, finally. <laughs> finally here, the Microsoft Surface. Is, is that what you have right there? Is that a Surface tablet? No. <laughs> no hey, very interesting device, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's looking. Here's, here's my thoughts on it. Okay. The, the recent history of Microsoft outside of Windows – uh, here with, with Windows Phone as they transition from Windows Phone 6 to Windows Phone 7, now to Windows Phone 8, and now with these Surface devices is they've yet to, in that string of things, come out with something that you feel like it's finished. And like this is go this is the thing. Yeah. Um, I, so Windows Phone 7, we've got this new thing, Windows Phone 7, look at these live tiles, it's really cool. Less than a year later, Oh, by the way, Windows Phone 7 isn't going to exist anymore. It's now Windows Phone 8. And if you bought a Windows Phone 7 device, yeah, you're not going to be able to update it to Windows Phone 8 because we're just kind of leaving that behind because yeah. this platform is better. Um, this, if they stick with this, mm -hmm. I think that they have, they have potential. They've got to do a couple different things. One, they've got to educate people a little bit better mm -hmm. in what is Windows RT. What is it? What is yeah. Windows? That's on, not retweet. No. Or runtime. Oh, I don't even know what it is. 
But what is <laughs> what is Windows RT that runs on a that runs on a uh, ARM processor versus what is Windows 8 that runs on an Intel mm-hmm. or AMD processor? Yeah. What are the differences? What is the software about? And if they if they can do that. And there's been a few missteps along the way. Like they, sh- I don't understand why in the world they didn't have a software developers kit for this thing before it came out because they're releasing these devices. And the big thing is, there's nothing in the app store. There's no, there's no yeah. applications. Well, the reason is nobody could develop except for like these select, yeah. just a couple people could develop applications yeah. for that. They needed there's, to get that out and let people build for there, that. There's less. I think there's only 2,500 apps in the Windows Surface Store, and RT officially stands for nothing. Um, <laughs> stand for anything. Tom Merritt made. Uh, Tom Merritt is with the Twit Network. Uh, he said when you take all of the reviews and mash them together, he said the quick and dirty is that this is a wonderful hardware device right. mm-hmm. lacking good applications. Right. Um, Harry McCracken, interesting, the guy that this article we point to, he also did an article on Windows Eight, and this it, he loves the phone, and he says this that. He thinks it's there, and he said in the past, I mean, Apple has done a great job in that. The reason people went to Apple for their products is because it just works. It was a better platform. He feels like Microsoft has something, but he said, are they just too late in the game now? So with Windows 8, he said, I think I think the, the, the phone, all this stuff, he talked about the architecture, he said, for developers. He said, this is a really good thing now. He said, because with Windows 8, with the RT, and with Windows Phone 8, he said a developer can easily make an app that will go all, all three. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But the but the SDK, the development kit to do that, where was it? Like why? Oh, well, why, are, mean, why are we just yeah, now being just, able to start with this? When's the official release date for the Surface? It's already come out. Oh, it's out. Oh, so oh, I was saving up money to get it, but I I was listening to Paul Thorat, who is a die i mean he, he's a core windows man he scared me half to death so i thought i'm gonna just keep my hands off and see how things go and i'll yeah. point towards the, the the there's going to be a surface pro like in january is what they're which saying which will have the intel right. processor which will run the full desktop environment that the other one doesn't and that that's the confusion now yeah. i mean the i think i think apple's apple people understand this better because yeah. my, my analogy is this the difference between RT, you know, running on an ARM chip and um, the tablet running on an Intel is, on the Intel, it's just like having iOS six and uh, OS ten running on the same same one. Yeah, and, but it is. that's what it's doing. Basically, it's yeah, what it's, it's doing. it's like having a mobile and the, the mobile operating yeah. system and the desktop operating system on the same device. Yep. Uh, if if you're running that that way. But an RT yeah. tablet is a mobile operating system. But they've muddied the water right. yeah. by, for some reason, including a desktop environment that only works as of right now with Office with the Office software. So why do we? Why do we even have? Like, why does it even exist? Why even put it there? Why muddy the the waters on that? Because like. Well, part part of that part of that the, the, part of their answer is going to be this: that we're going to continue to develop apps where that's going to just grow and grow and grow, um, and and that that may happen. I mean, it's it's just a matter of developers who's going to get on board. That's the thing is is to me, if if I were a developer and I'm not, but I've I've played one on TV before, <laughs> but to me to have that ability to create one app that's cross platform, uh, PC. Uh, Surface and phone, that's that's not a that's not a bad deal right there, and you guys, I am. But, no, but, no. But let's do okay. this now. Okay, so I don't know. Uh, looks like we're gonna have Dr. Todd Voss, uh, president of Southern Wesleyan University, in studio next week. We had a schedule president. change, but but let me let's do this. Let's do an experiment next week because Matthew makes a great point on Windows Eight. Have you have you used Windows Eight? Not. All right. Next week, let's have Heath. I'll have the Windows 8 computer up, and after our interview with Voss, let's just uh, let's, let's have Heath get to the control panel and don't don't you research it. I will. Not, oh, yeah, no, no, no I, dude, Please that'll be fun. Don't Absolutely. research anything. Absolutely. And and we're just going to put a Windows 8 before you because the paradigm shift is Herculean. For I cannot remember which episode it was. But when they redid Office to easily install on stuff, except Windows 8 at the time, we tried to demo that live on a Windows laptop during the show. <laughs> that was running Windows 8. It was running Windows yeah, 8. It so so I, exactly, it wouldn't load that Office. We didn't know that at the time. Yeah. But 
Here's Matthew TG. I can I can operate Windows. I was just in Windows Seven this past weekend working on a video thing for for somebody, and it was it, it was fantastic. Yeah. Do you remember the hard time I, I had? I was trying to figure out what's going on and how can I get to the control panel and change these settings? And, what in the and world? It was, listen, it was simple to get to it once you knew. Yeah. Once exactly. you knew. But you're doing, like, you're, you know, I mean, for but me, it's like I'm doing a search on Google. How do I get to control panel yeah. on Windows 8? Yeah. It's such a paradigm shift. Uh, that's, not, uh, that's not the world's worst <coughs> thing. There's got to be there's got to be times for innovation that you change the paradigm of how stuff works yeah. and that it, it that that's great but the paradigm that they're trying to put on a laptop with a trackpad is a touch interface yeah. paradigm it, I'm sure it's fantastic <laughs> and I'm sure I would have figured it out very easily yeah. on a tablet can, but can I'm we, not doing it can we set that up and get a camera on it oh yeah so that people can oh, yeah. watch Heath yeah and people know. I mean, no one is more anti Windows. I mean, I don't even like Windows. Well, see, no, that's, that's, not that's, not, Windows. that's not fair. I, we need to have what we really need is a Windows Seven user, somebody who who right yeah, now true. uses no. Windows Seven, who's who thinks Windows wise, yeah. to come in and sit down behind right. a Windows Eight computer. You're right, and see the the reaction like that. That's what we need. That would be best. Like someone like a Joan Rampy, yeah, who works in Windows Seven all day long. Oh yeah, yeah. Maybe we'll see. Yeah, so Heath, trying to Heath wants the spot there, but no, I like that idea. See, yeah, you got to have a, a dedicated Windows person. Um, I don't know. We'll work on that. Yeah. All right. Uh, but if you want a tablet with its own kickstand and a keyboard, the Microsoft Surface. I, I'm there. not lying. Uh, part of me really wants that. I mean, I'm, I'm to be. I, mean, I would love to have the Surface, but. Paul Thrax just time. scared me half to death. And that's exactly. kind of that's that's kind of the way you have to be with Windows these days. Yeah, it's more of a watch and wait mentality. Because if you invest, who's to say Microsoft's not just going to pull the rug out from underneath you like they did with Windows, Windows 7, Seven and say, "Hey, now, okay, so this was kind of a weird idea. We feel like the future is actually here." And that. So when are they going to come out with the little Surface? I don't know. <laughs> the Surface. You always meaning. ask that. You know. The hard penetrating questions. All right, real quick here. Let's talk about what's coming up. As we already told you, Dr. Todd Voss, president of Southern Wesleyan University, the will be with president. us. So on election day, the president will be with us. That's right. Yes. The All right. president. November the 13th, we're bringing Beth Peterson in studio and via Skype. We're going to uh, also include Priscilla Hammonds. We're going to talk about the Mystery Church Shopper and overall just the benefits of bringing someone from the outside of your church in. Um, and people aren't aware that they're there to kind of look at the church and evaluate it. So and let me then, put out a word to Priscilla. Don't forget to bring your MacBook in for Skype on that day. Yeah. Bring it into the office with you because yeah. we don't want to fool with anything yeah. else. All right. <laughs> I'll, be on, um, I'll be on assignment that se way. Second half of the show, we have Stevan uh, Sheets who's going to join us, and we're going to just talk about uh, Christmas gadgets and our Christmas list for gadgets and, and beyond that as well. Um Let's see, on November the 20th, Dr. Joanne Lyon, right there, General Superintendent of the Wesleyan Church, will join us and really want to spend a lot of our time talking more about compassionate ministries. Um, the last time she was on, we, we, you know, we talked about the denomination, and I really want to funnel this down because when she founded World Hope, I mean, it really was this whole area of compassionate ministries that um, Joan was so versed in and really got World Hope off the ground. So we want to talk about that. I think I should green screen her into that picture that day. Wouldn't that be fun? Like if, if <laughs> the video of her, us from the wall. Where, yeah, where, <laughs> there she is. Well, of course, that would put me like this. Right? Yes, yeah, <laughs> yes. That is really good. All right, <laughs> all right. And then November the twenty seventh, uh, Phil Stevenson will be with us, and uh, we'll talk about his book, The Ripple Church: Multiply Your Ministry by, by Parenting New Churches. I um, want to remind you that we are doing a giveaway this week, and it is um, from the author that we just talked to, What They Didn't Teach You in Seminary. That will be live later today when our show goes up. All right. Heath, where can our listeners find you on the Internet? Normally they can find me at heathmullican.com, but Sandy has knocked out the server, so go there when you can. At least we assume that's what happened. That is what happened. It's just running slow. There could also be what an infiltration got? in the WordPress <laughs> installation a, no, due to a non-updated no, no, plugin. Does he no. have any kind of history with stuff like this? <laughs> One time. <laughs> two times. <laughs> Listen, I'm the only Heath Mulliken in the world. So if you type in Heath Mulliken, you'll find me. Follow me on Twitter. Be my Facebook friend. I love everybody. <laughs>
<laughs> You're so easy. All right, um, Matthew. <laughs> you can find me at MatthewTG.com. And Tony. You can find me at Twitter, AKC64. As always, uh, if you want to do any further research on anything we discussed today, you can find all the links to the stories we covered at our website, thetechnologyshow.com. If you want to contact us, send your emails to thetechnologyshow at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail by calling us at 3049-TEOLOGY. That's 304-986-5649. Leave a message, and we may even play your comments on the air. As always, thanks for joining us. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Adios.